All right. So we're going to be talking about behavior basics. I'll try and go really fast. I might skip things. We'll see. But I'm the one who made us late. So to be fair, everyone blame me. So today we're going to be talking about behavior. Um, our learning objectives, we want to provide examples of developmentally appropriate disruptive behaviors during childhood and adolescence, describe the typical course of disruptive behavior and treatment options, and name strategies that caregivers of young children can do. So when we first look at disruptive behaviors, I think it's important to talk about the developmental aspects. So uh, bad behavior or disruptive behavior is very developmentally appropriate a lot of the time. So uh, you can see at all different ages, there's sort of expected disruptive behavior. Um, now, it's a little bit different at each age. And I, I think part of the reason for that is because we have to learn how to test limits based on where we're at in life and what we need to learn. So um, this is Eric, Erickson, Eric Erickson's staged theory uh, of psychosocial stages. And you can see here, for example, the, so he, what he said was we have to be able to get past each stage to go on to the next stage. Um, <clears throat> so let's say early childhood, ages one to three. So you can see here it says autonomy versus shame. So this is when we're expecting like a toddler to be able to be autonomous or try to be autonomous anyway. So this is the learning how to be potty trained, learning how to put their clothes on. It's learning the sort of the power that they have. And we can relate back to this where, what are the appropriate disruptive behaviors at this age? You can see things like saying no, say, wanting to do things independently, like me do it, saying mine about things that aren't even theirs. So it makes sense in the context that they're trying to deal with this conflict of their own power. So really, it makes sense that not only are uh, disruptive behaviors often developmental, but they're actually healthy to some degree. So now, when does it be go from healthy to not healthy? Or when is it uh, a behavior versus a disruptive behavior? So the way that I think about this, and I'm sure people can define it differently, but um, I think testing the boundaries or on this cute little image I found, everything to the left of the last image <laughs> Um, those are all developmentally appropriate. So looking for boundaries, finding, testing, stretching, pushing, stepping over, those are all kind of normal. Um, so maybe if we're talking about a my three-year-old, you know, if I give him one sticker, he says, can I have another sticker? So I said, just one. And he still says, but can I have another? So that's him testing the boundaries. That's him trying to figure life out. Um, same thing if you think of a 16 year old who's now staying out later and they instead of staying out till 11 which is the curfew they stay out till 12 that's a little bit of stepping over the boundaries that's a little bit a little too far now it's it's interesting because some boundaries are um different in different families uh so you can have some families that would say that that teenager staying an hour later is really a broken boundary it's not just stepping over it so when you think about that, it's good to get the context of the families and how they operate when they're there for a behavioral discussion and they say, hey, my kid does this, but this is what's expected. It can be helpful to know the context that they're in. Um, so when we start looking at disruptive behavior disorders is when we're looking at this little guy over here all the way to the right of breaking through boundaries. So it's when kids really fully break the boundaries that a lot of times we're looking at a disruptive behavior disorder, especially if it happens more than once. So for this, I might think, okay, let's take that 16 year old that stayed at an hour too late. That's kind of pushing it. But then let's say we take that same 16 year old and now they are regularly leaving all weekend, not coming home, not telling their parents where they go. That's, that's a little bit more of a really stepping over the limit. Right, so that's scary. Often when we get into this sort of a pattern of scary behavior of, you know, things that could hurt other people, hurt themselves, that's when we start thinking of a disruptive behavior disorder. So that's that's sort of how I uh, think about it when someone presents. Now, <clears throat> since I'm a psychiatrist and it's my job to look at what's pathological more than what's normal, I will talk about uh, some of our disruptive behavior disorders in the DSM. Uh, now, disruptive behavior disorders are common in general, but that being said, we only have two specific ones in the DSM, and that's oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. So uh, you can see here, I have some of the stats. So two to 16% of youth have oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder you see in six to 9%. Now they have found that ODD, 
on average, so oppositional defiant disorder, two thirds of the time gets better. Um, so years later, kids won't meet the criteria. What happens is that there's a trajectory that we worry about. So I'll sort of do it from this standpoint. What we worry about is we have our normal, adaptive, developmental, disruptive behaviors. And that's the majority of kids, honestly. So that's almost all. Then we get a small subsection of that and they develop oppositional defiant disorder. So that's when they're starting to break those limits, like in a more severe way and a pattern in a way that's harmful. Um, <clears throat> the majority of those are then going to get better. But what happens to the ones that don't? The, the trajectory that we think of in psychiatry is that they're then at higher risk for developing conduct disorder. Now, conduct disorder is when kids don't, they're not just against authority. They, um, it's, it's more extreme than that. It's more um, violating others' norms. It's, it can be hurting people more. Um, there can be a ca callousness aspect. And then what we ultimately worry about, one reason that we talk about and treat disorders is, or the developmental uh, disruptive disorders, is not just because of the damage they're causing in the moment, but what they can become. So what we worry about is then conduct disorder becoming antisocial personality disorder when kids are 18, or I mean, are adults. So now it doesn't always have to go like this. It can technically, someone can come in and I will diagnose them with a conduct disorder and they maybe hadn't been diagnosed with an oppositional defiant disorder before. It's not that common, but it can happen. Usually uh, we end up seeing two spikes in the sort of extreme behavior. So for behavioral disorders, often we see kids sort of like elementary and a little bit later, we see a spike of that. Now kids are starting to act out and then we'll see another spike around puberty. So that's when conduct disorder is diagnosed most, puberty and then sort of that earlier age. And the reason is, I don't know entirely, but the reason is basically that you have kids that started off with uh, disruptive behaviors, then got ODD, then got conduct disorder. So they're sort of following that path. Versus there's some kids that actually didn't have a huge problem with behaviors, but then what happened was they got to those teenage years and puberty hit and life hit and maybe the pandemic hit, I don't know. So they have a lot of more environmental things and even uh, you know biological that are impacting them. And so at that point, let's say they you have a shy, quiet kid that's always followed the rules, but um, now really wants to make friends and falls into sort of the bad crowd. You know, and that bad crowd encourages drug use, for example, or stealing things. That's when we start to see that little um, dip up in, in diagnosis of conduct disorder is around that age. The good news is that let's say they've done fine most of their life and now you're seeing these behaviors in adolescence. Um, those are more than likely going to calm down. So the, the statistics would say, you know, if you've already, if you haven't had behavioral problems, but then develop it at 16, there's a better chance, that's, that's a little bit more of a better prognostic factor than let's say a kid who's five with conduct disorder. So if you've had most of your life where you can follow the rules and you can um, you do what you need to do, then usually it's people go through like a bump, you know? So there are people who they have tough teenage years and then they end up being perfectly fine members of society who can handle things. Now, the people that we worry about more prognostically are the kids who had an early diagnosis, early severe diagnosis of ODD and then conduct disorder. So for example, a new, a new oppositional defined disorder or conduct disorder at eight is upsetting, but that's different than a severe uh, conduct disorder or oppositional defined disorder at four or five. What we see is if the more intense it is, the more problematic it is and the earlier it is, that's a worse prognostic factor. So that is why we want to get interventions as early as we can, because they are more likely to turn into conduct disorder, to turn into antisocial. And part of it is because they get into this negative spiral is how I see it. So what happens is those kids that um, maybe are mean to people, they end up being friends with bullies. And then they end up uh, bullying other people. And then maybe, you know, they their family is really frustrated with them for having behavioral problems. So the family yells at them. And then these kids are upset all the time. And, and then maybe they're not doing well in school. So what happens is it gets to be this sort of like factor upon factor ends up adding. So the earlier the behavioral problems, the more we need to not just have interventions, but have prevention of the behavior. Um, so this is sort of how we see things going. 
Now, <clears throat> since I'm a psychiatrist, I also have to talk about drugs, uh, which it's interesting. So with disruptive behavior disorders, the first line of the treatment is therapy. Um, and that's actually the main line. So that's, uh, we have, there's no FDA indicated medication for disruptive behavior disorder. Uh, we only use the meds to help with symptoms. So the way I conceptualize it is, let's say I am adding Risperdal or Guanfacine. I see that we're trying to prevent that kid from the uh, intense negative spiral they might be going down. So let's say we use Risperdal to prevent their aggression. Now, at the same time, it's not treating the underlying problem, but maybe if they're less aggressive because they're a little bit more um, medicated, then maybe they can learn more pro-positive behavior, pro-social behaviors, or maybe they can make friends with people who can teach them. Like we get a little bit of a break uh, so that kids can hopefully make things better. That's how I see adding something like Risperdal, but I always warn parents like this still is not the end-all be-all. This is not going to work for forever necessarily. Um, usually we start with, if it's really bad behavior, we start with an atypical antipsychotic. Um, that being said, it's important if you can to try and figure out if there's an underlying problem. Is this a kid who has really bad ADHD and poor frustration tolerance and is so acting out now because they can't tolerate anything? Then it would be really important to treat the ADHD. And I like to tell parents like, okay, in that case, let's say we treat the ADHD and they don't have a behavior disorder underlying. A lot of times the behaviors will get better because a kid can stop and think about what they're going to do. But let's say they do have a behavior disorder. Let's say they have comorbid ODD and ADHD. Just because we medicate that child so that they can pay attention does not mean they're going to make better choices. That's the interesting thing. So if you get a kid that likes to call people names um, and can now think about it, they're still going to call people names if they want to. Like it doesn't change the behavior by treating the underlying condition. It just makes it so that kids are more flexible to make uh, their own choices with behavior. Oh, sorry, I'm checking my clock to make sure my time. Okay, so I don't want to go too far into meds. Um, I did put a bunch of information on here if you ever want to look back, um, just because meds are not the main indication. So we use them, but it's kind of like a Band-Aid approach, to be totally honest. Now, that Band-Aid approach can still help with safety, but it's not going to be the core of how we treat it. Um, for mild to moderate behaviors, I usually do guanfacine or clonidine. I usually start with guanfacine because of the longer half-life, so you get more coverage throughout the day. Clonidine is a little bit more potent and does actually work a little bit better, I think, but you have to dose it like four times a day, which for kids who are already arguing and disruptive is very difficult. Um, so I will usually start with guanfacine and just kind of see how it goes. Now, for the severe behaviors, that's usually when we go to an atypical antipsychotic. If the behavior is getting slowly worse, I will often start with guanfacine. But let's say um, this is a family that I haven't seen in a couple of months, and suddenly something is new. This child who, I don't know, had autism and some disruptive behaviors is now hitting his head and hurting himself. So when it gets to be more severe, I may use an atypical first, just because we need to like, the question is the risks versus benefits. In that case, if we're worried about someone's safety, we might use the heavy hitter medications more because it's literally like helping them to not hurt themselves or others. So that's sort of how I see things. Um, Risperdal has been studied the most, but we often use Risperdal first and then if not that, Abilify. The nice thing is that it comes in liquid, so just so you know, when you do have young kids who won't swallow things, there is a liquid version. Now, insurance often puts up a fight about it, so you have to get a prior auth, but it can be really nifty for those kids who refuse to take um, pills. Now, let's see you have a kid who is, maybe they're okay most of the time, but they get aggressive. I have one like this right now who gets injections monthly, and he's kind of just like a, an anxious ADHD kid who, he also has Tourette's, so he gets stuck on stuff. And for the most part, he's fine. Like we don't see disruptive behavior, but he has to get this injection into his stomach every month. And he just like flips out and hits people because he's so anxious. Usually when I see that kind of stuff, these are the things I try. Hydroxazine first, then maybe a, a atypical antipsychotic or trazodone. I don't usually do a benzo in kids, not so much because of the like um, addictive ability, because if we're just doing it as needed, I'm not too worried. It's because kids are prone to something called a paradoxical uh, reaction. 
So they are more likely to get a benzo and get even worse. Um, so that's that's my caution. It's not like, ooh, benzos are bad. It's more like in the pediatric population, you really don't know, are you going to make this kid worse or better? Additionally, they have shown that people who stay on benzos regularly for three months or more, there's an increased chance of dementia. So we don't want to have a kid on a regular benzo early on for a long time because that's really potentially limiting their brain. So these are the things that I usually go to. That being said, that's my whole part. Kelly, you're up. I'll, I'll move the slides as you tell me to move them. Thank you. Yeah, thank so, you. yeah now we're going to talk about uh, therapies, uh, common therapies that um, have an evidence base uh, across a variety of ages. And I'm not going to get too much into the nitty gritty of the therapies. Um, the parts that are behavior management, um, those building blocks, um, Dr. Kopelman are gonna, is going to be going over after, after my section. So um, stay tuned for those. Uh, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, therapy is the primary treatment, considered the main treatment for disruptive behaviors. Um, the, the big, the big uh, areas, or sorry, the big um, categories of evidence-based therapies are uh, parent behavior therapy, family therapy, and um, there are some cognitive behavioral therapies as well um, that are indicated. I'm not going to go over those um, too much today, um, but certainly um, they focus on um, self-management and um, being able to think through things before acting. Um, in addition, if if something like anxiety is driving the disruptive behavior, um, if you if um, that's actually what's what's causing the child to to have some externalizing symptoms, cognitive behavior, behavior therapy, of course, would be indicated for the anxiety or or depression as well. Um, so you know, different therapies target different age groups. Um, they not all not all therapies are indicated for all age groups. So we're going to kind of go through in sections, starting with preschoolers. So for those young kids, um, we think a lot about parent behavior therapy, and um, that's kind of the generic category. Um, and within that category, there's sort of two modalities for delivering this. First is um, by working um, with parents. Um, typically, most of the things that have been researched um, have been um, parenting groups um, where, where parents together are learning um, behavior management skills. The other subcategory is dyadic approaches, um, where you are teaching and coaching parents um, within a parent-child session, um, these same types of skills that would be, be covered in the group. Uh, the idea is really um, talking with parents and, and thinking through what's happening before and after the disruptive behavior occurs to really be able to increase pro-social behaviors, decrease those disruptive behaviors over time. And then most also have a component that work on strengthening um, parent-child relationships over time. So things like really working on um, positive and appropriate communication with one another. So again, um, this is a very um, popular format for preschool age kids and um, two that have some of the best evidence base um, and that we have here in Iowa um, and, and many, many places are uh, parent-child interaction therapy and incredible years. Now, I'm not trained in incredible years. Um, I think it's a really good program. You can go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, but I have uh, had some training and have been um, practicing parent-child interaction therapy for some time now. So I do want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so, you know, when you're um, teaching and coaching a parent in these skills, um, the idea is then that they're being the interventionist with their child. And PCIT is really cool because um, not only are you teaching and coaching, but you're doing that coaching in real time. Um, so it's live coaching and um, you as the therapist giving feedback to the parent, oftentimes through a little Bluetooth or other um, bug in their ear um, while they're working with their child. Uh, and um, typically PCIT lasts from about 12 to 20 weekly sessions. 
um, with parents practicing the skills in between sessions at home. One thing I really like about PCIT is that you um, collect multiple types of um, information about what's going on behaviorally. So you're using your behavior observations and there's a strict coding uh, that you do of those sorts of things, but you're also getting ratings from parents and teachers about how things are going out in the world. Um, in Iowa, uh, we uh, have a lot of therapists trained in what's called Iowa PCIT. And basically, um, uh, Dr. Beth Trotman, who's here at the University of Iowa, uh, is, uh, is an expert in attachment theory and wanted to take some of the ideas and constructs from attachment theory and apply them to this behavioral model. Um, and overall, like, what we're trying to do with that is um, be a little bit more individualized with the dyad and being able to kind of coach to um, to their needs and to the way that, that they do things relationally. Um, and so we think both about attachment of the parent and child, as well as the parent's um, state of mind um, with regard to their own attachment style or, or pattern. The first part of PCIT is uh, child-directed interaction or CDI. Um, and this is where we're really working on some of that uh, increasing pro-social skills and positive communication. And um, uh, CDI has gotten a lot of uh, nice press lately um, out in popular media. Um, we've been hearing some talk about pride skills. NPR did a really nice piece. Um, and the idea is that um, the caregiver is really going to follow their child's lead in play. Um, sometimes we call this special play time. It works really well with um, toys that are constructive in nature or um, little play sets, things where they can do some, some pretending and functional play. Um, really want to avoid toys or activities that are going to be problematic where there's going to be um, limits that need to be set or directions that need to be given. Those don't work so well for this type of type of play. And um, what we um, teach and coach parents to do is to use pride skills. So that stands for praise, reflect, imitate, describe, and enjoy. Um, praise is a specific kind of praise where we are labeling um, what we like about behavior. So not just thanks, but thanks for sharing your toys with me. Reflecting just means repeating back what the child's saying. Um, so they're aware that you're uh, attending and, and paying attention to um, what's interesting to them. Imitating is doing what they do. And describing is um, almost like being a sports broadcaster and describing what they're doing with the toy. So you put a hat on Mr. Potato Hood, you handed me a blue block, that sort of thing. And then we really, you know, work on enthusiasm and people having a good time as they're playing once they're getting these, these uh, skills down. So go ahead. We'll just watch just a tiniest clip of, uh, this is actually a PCIT trainer, but I think this is his actual kid, um, just to get a little taste of what this sounds like in practice. Maybe. Do you Can you hear? I cannot hear it. Okay, sorry, I have to stop and reshare really quick. I always do this, sorry everybody. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. Share. Hold on. One more second. I will figure this out. Here we go. Got it. Uh, well, that's weird. It doesn't let me, it's not letting me share the sound. Okay, well, Sorry. that is strange. Um. I will uh, make sure um, Copy has the link to that video um, in case you would want to look it online. It's a researcher named Jason Gent. And I'll also just say that Dr. Gent um, was one of the um, early pioneers of um, looking at uh, telehealth behavior, dyadic telehealth behavior therapies. Um, so a lot of his research um, has become very, very important in recent years um, for showing that you can do this kind of therapy, um, not just when you're in person, but over, over telehealth. Okay, go ahead and advance to the next slide then.
So yeah, we have um, parents do this about five minutes a day. We have them turn off distracting things like their phone or televisions, that sort of thing. Um, we have them use those pride skills, and we also ask them to avoid giving questions or commands during these play during these plays or directions. We also try to avoid um, saying things that are negative, like don't or stop. If um, something requires that kind of language, then we just end the play for the day. Um, but things that are, you know, maybe just more annoying behaviors that can be ignored, um, we do encourage parents to ignore those things and um, to have this kind of play every day, regardless of what the behavior looks like throughout the day. Okay, so that's a little bit about child-directed interaction. Um, now I want to talk just briefly about um, parent behavior therapy and more of the school age child. A um, couple really good examples would be parent management training um, out of Oregon and Triple P. Um, we don't have a lot of Triple P in Iowa. I do think we have a lot of parent management training, but um, sometimes with various names. Um, what I'll say is, you know, the best evidence did lie with kind of the like the Oregon model, and it's now called Generation PMTO. Um, and the idea is that you're working with parents on a lot of these same skills, but more um, school age appropriateness, um, teaching positive behavior, teaching appropriate consequences, uh, working with parents on how to monitor and supervise their child's behavior, um, some stuff on pr uh, problem solving between family members, and then lots of um, identifying opportunities for positive involvement in, in the child's activities as well. And then lastly, um, during the adolescent years, um, we think about, um, uh, you know, thinking about some of those um, conduct disorder um, and uh, antisocial activities. Um, a lot of times our therapies um, are focused on that in terms of outcome. And that's certainly true of the two I have here as examples, functional family therapy or FFT and multisystemic therapy, MST. Um, so these are both fairly intensive treatments for juvenile offenders. Um, so ages 12 to 17 and their families. And um, the, uh, you know, the, the part of the data in terms of what they're trying to do is decrease uh, criminal behavior and decrease out of home placements. Now it becomes really fairly intensive. Um, this slide isn't purposely meant to be overwhelming here. Um, you know, within these uh, interventions and program components, you're gonna see some of the same things um, that we talked about in terms of behavior management, but there's also a much more kind of wraparound feel to it where they're thinking about the child's environment. Um, as a whole in terms of the family, the peers, the community, um, and what can be targeted. Um, so uh, they think about risk factors, protective factors, um, all with both immediate outcome as well as long-term trajectory in mind. Um, so it is a more intensive uh, treatment to be sure, and um, one where a therapist is going to be spending quite a lot of time um, with, a, with a child and their family when they're doing this type of type of intervention. All right, Todd. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so Kelly described some really nice evidence-based kind of treatment packages for these disruptive behaviors. I'm going to as Kelly mentioned, talk a little bit more about just some specific building blocks or techniques, pearls, whatever you want to, however you want to think about them um, that you might be able to utilize in your practice. Um, so just to kind of start off with as a psychologist who works with children through adults with, with behaviors of concern, um, just wanted to share a list of kind of the most common concerns that, that are referred to me. And this is a little bit more child focused but probably things that you experience uh, in your daily practice, or if you're a parent or caregiver, I'm sure all of these um, are very familiar to you. Uh, next slide. So as Dr. Johnson mentioned a little bit earlier, I think the first step for me when I'm getting a patient in clinic is still deciding, is this kind of developmentally expected behavior? In which case the real focus is just on kind of guidance or parent education. Or is this kind of overstepping that line um, that was on that far corner of that nice slide? And is this something where we really want to focus on intervention or treatment? So this is kind of the 
uh, it's not exhaustive, but a list of factors that I think about um, when I'm trying to make that decision, you know, is this, you know, education versus intervention. So I think about things like the severity, the frequency and the duration, all little kids, almost tantrum. But, you know, I'll see some children where parents will say it's two or three hours a day um, and they're banging their head, you know, or they're destroying property. So that pulls it over the line. Um, the consequences of that child's behavior, um, maybe not the, the, the nicest way to put it, but there are cer certain behaviors that I think about as one trial learning in the sense that it only takes one opportunity, unfortunately, for that child to get really hurt. Um, you know, and that might be a really impulsive kid who's stepping in front of cars or children who are jumping out of windows. Um, so even though it doesn't happen that often, we're still, my level of concern is really high. Um, I think about the context under which the behavior happens. Um, lying, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, can be very typical. Um, and especially if, if it's lying for something like a pro-social reason, like a child doesn't want to hurt another child's feelings. So maybe lies about the birthday party. Or a child lies because they don't want to get in trouble and says, oh, I didn't take the cookie, mom, when they did. Pretty normal, you know, at four or five years of age. If somebody's lying about taking money, you know, from their dad's wallet, again, um, a little bit more concerning. I think about the tra trajectory of the child, um, you know, in just toilet training as one example. If the child was completely to toilet trained for several years, seven, eight years old, that's when the concerns start to happen. Um, obviously, we want to look at reasons why. And then Dr. Johnson talked about this too, you know, that you really want to look at the child and the concerns within this broader context of, of the family, um, social, cultural norms. So really, even though they're coming to me already, it, they've been referred for behavior concerns, I really want to have that discussion before just jumping into treatment. And these are just some examples. I'm not going to go through this list here of kind of parameters of what to expect for different types of younger child behaviors, how often they happen. And sometimes parents are surprised, you know, especially maybe it's a first time parent and their child's having tantrums or not telling the truth and um, they get pretty freaked out. And I can appreciate that. And this can be reassuring to say, it's not that we're happy your child is doing that most of the time, but um, we don't necessarily need to intervene. Let's kind of monitor it and giving them some general strategies. I also think about the child again, kind of in a context of what else is going on. There are certain diagnoses that are not causal. In other words, if a child has one of these diagnoses, it's not a requirement that they're going to have behaviors of concern, but it does place them at higher risk. And that's anything from language or communication disorders to learning disorders, intellectual disability, TBI, and autism spectrum disorders. If you look at the research, Somebody with that diagnosis compared to, and I'm putting this in quotes, but a neurotypical child is at higher risk of some of those behaviors that were on that first slide. So this is a, a question that um, we often get is, why does my child do that? And fill in the behavior blank there, whatever the behavior is. And I think that's a really good, but hard question to answer. And it probably depends upon your theoretical orientation. Um, so just some examples, and you can click through this. Uh, my focus is the environment, and I'll talk about that um, in just a minute. But other people, you know, like my colleague, Dr. Trapman, may talk a little bit more about the temperament of the child, and there's great research on that. There are some genetic and physiological risk factors associated with some of these challenging behaviors. And then there certainly are biological factors. Um, you know, again, if somebody has a traumatic brain injury, Following that injury, their personality and their behavior may be quite different. In, in that case, we may be able to pinpoint it more than if it's a two-year-old or three-year-old who's starting to display behaviors of real concern. So I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan, um, have been since I was a kid, and I use him as kind of a, just an analogy. Um, so when I'm talking with parents and they're saying, why does my child do that? You know, I often say, well, just put on your detective hat a little bit and think about what is going on in the environment surrounding those behaviors. So we have to be detectives. So kind of the, the old fashioned behavior kind of sequence, it's been around for quite a while, but I still find it just kind of practical um, for me in my day-to-day my -day work is to think about what's called the antecedent, which is what is going on right before the behavior occurs, 
the behavior itself, and then the consequence, which is basically what happens after the behavior. And then once we understand that, we can start to look at making changes either on that before antecedent end or the after consequence end, or sometimes both uh, even at the same time. There are numerous examples of things that can happen on the antecedent level before a behavior occurs. These are just some common ones that, that I see in, in kids at home or in school. Maybe they were doing certain types of work tasks that were hard for them. Think about a child with a learning disability. Or I sometimes see kids in school who have done the exact same task, maybe for weeks on end. And I'm like, I would kind of want to bang my head against the floor too. You know, the second hundred time I've done the same folder activity. For some children and adults, changes in schedule or routines. You know, think about a child um, with autism and um, not all autistic children are like this, but some benefit from advanced warnings. Um, setting events are things like, and we've all experienced these, if I haven't slept well the night before, I'm running a little bit of a fever, you have constipation, dental pain, all of those can be what we call those setting events that don't necessarily cause problem behaviors, but they increase the likelihood that basically you're going to get a little bit more stressed out when you're asked to do something maybe that you don't like to do or you, you have to wait for something that you want. Uh, and then finally, what we call states of deprivation or states of satiation. So, um, you know, I'll see this sometimes where a child has access to their Game Boy or, you know, whatever it is, their, their um, tablet all of the time. And then um, the parent is trying to use that exact same um, technology as a reinforcer. And it's like, well, the kid has already had that for six hours today, and now you're expecting them to want to work to earn that. Um, the value of that reinforcer has probably been decreased. Next slide. So consequences, again, I could give many, many examples, but just trying to think about putting on our detective hat, what happened after the child's behavior? How did we or other people respond? So a child tantrums, that's behavior. A parent changes the expectation. And I'm a parent, I've done this myself, especially with my daughter's not listening, obviously, and she's in college now, but. She used to really not like to clean her room. She still doesn't, but she used to have some tantrums. And sometimes I would get so frustrated, that I'd say, you know what, you can do it later. Or a child swears and they're sent to the principal's office. That's the consequence, go to the principal's office. Or in a store, I'm guessing many of you have seen that huge selection of candy that's at the front. Toddler has a tantrum and the parents are like, just be quiet. You can pick one or two things now if you'll be quiet and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide. So just a couple kind of terminology things. People use this pretty loosely, you know, reinforcers. A reinforcer is just basically a consequence, something that follows the behavior, but it has to increase the future probability of that behavior. And it can be good or bad the way that we typically think about it. So just a couple of scenarios of, of, is it a reinforcer? A child raises their hand in a class, Teacher maybe walks over and gives them a nice high five. And then we notice in the future that child's starting to increase to raise their hand more. So that suggests that that attention, that high five is serving as a reinforcer for hand raising. Or Dr. Johnson, you know, goes to work and she sees her patients getting better, right? She's helping children. So she continues going to work. That suggests to me there's something about helping children that is reinforcing for her. And I know there is. Or I'll see this too sometimes, a student is maybe throwing things at school or hitting and they're suspended, they go back to school and the behavior continues. So it's possible there's something about being suspended that's kind of reinforcing for that kid. It's not serving as a punisher. And that leads me to punishers. Punishers are just consequences that decrease the future likelihood of a behavior. Um, next slide. So these are just kind of common punishers. It's not exhaustive timeout from reinforcement. This is probably the most common punishment-based consequence that parents give. I'm guessing most of us have given timeout in one form or the other. It could be that whole one, two, three magic that was popular when I was learning about timeout procedures. It could be sending a kid to a room. Um, it could just be walking away from a child and not giving them attention. Those would all be examples of timeouts. Response costs, sorry, go back to that slide for just a second, are like taking things away. 
Um, so if you speed, like I have a, just a few times in my life and actually gotten caught and you get a ticket, um, you're getting money taken away, right? So that would be what we call a response cost procedure. And just other ones are loss of a privilege or threatening it, um, a reprimand, physical punishment is definitely intended to be a punisher. Sometimes it's not. But I want to point out that things that some people think about as reinforcers for some children might serve as punishers. So I've worked with children who do not like a lot of attention, right? They don't like that over-enthusiastic praise. Um, they actually hate it. So that may decrease the behavior because they're going to do whatever they can to avoid being the center of attention. Um, so we really have to think about reinforcers and punishers quite as individualized responses. We can't say every child likes stickers, every child likes soda, every child likes attention. It's a case by case basis. So I just wanted to end with a few common antecedent and consequence strategies. Hopefully these are just practical things. Um, I call it calendar time and some of my colleagues at Iowa here do. The technical term is probably non-contingent reinforcement. And I usually recommend this when there's a negative interaction that's kind of persistent, ongoing between a parent and a child, and they feel like they just don't know how to change that dynamic. So I'll say, just set up a time on your calendar once or twice a week where you're gonna do something fun with your child. Maybe it's only 20 or 30 minutes a week that you both enjoy, regardless of how your child has done at home or regardless of how she's done at school. And it's just a way for you and your child to have fun together. Um, and it shows your child that you care about them and they'll remember those things, those times together. Um, positive routines, consistent routines is another antecedent strategy that can be really helpful for some of the children that I work with. Advanced warnings so that they know what to expect prior to transitions. Letting kids with ADHD especially run around in structured ways at school, there's research to show that can be helpful. And I don't mean running up and down the hallways at school, but planned physical breaks, you know, for a couple minutes, every 30 minutes or so, even just going and bringing something to another classroom. Um, behavioral momentum, and then I'll stop on this slide, but um, for kids who get really non-compliant, sometimes having them do three or four easy, fun activities before you present the real demand, you know, so having a teacher or a parent say, hey, give me five, touch your nose, spin around twice, what's two plus two, you know, and then going into the work kind of just sets them up more positively. And then there are a lot of consequence-based strategies. We all could talk for you know another hour about these, but you've probably heard about catching a child being good and providing very specific praise. I really like how you filled in the blank and trying to really increase the frequency with which a parent or a teacher does that is one of the common recommendations that I give. I have a link here to a lot of rich information on how reinforcement plans can be set up. There's actually a lot of things that you can think about. You can go beyond the sticker charts, although I like those stickers in this picture, but that, you know, that may work for some children, but there are other ways that reinforcement plans can be set up. And with older children, I often think about what are called behavior contracts. So that's kind of setting up very specific stipulations, kind of like we have at work, right? If you do X, Y, and Z, then this will result. If you don't, then this will result. And I kind of treat it like a legal document, even though it's clearly not. I'm not a lawyer, but I'll have the parent and the child sign it. Um, and then I'll kind of review the progress and tweak it as needed. So just real quick, putting it all together. Step one for me behaviorally, what do I do? Is this kind of normative like Dr. Johnson was talking about? Or is it worthy of intervention? I think putting on my Sherlock Holmes hat, what's going on before and after the behavior. And then I focus on those antecedent and consequence or positive reinforcement strategies. And then always, you know, feel free to refer on if, if those basic approaches are not working. Well, thank you for this fantastic um, presentation. So we have time to take questions. So please type your question in the Q&A and we'll cover as many questions as time allows. And we did have a couple of questions submitted to um, that registrants submitted when they registered. So I'll kick, it, kick us off with those. Um, have you seen an increase in more serious 
uh, behaviors um, during the pandemic? And what are ways um, providers and parents can address those things? I don't know, do you guys want to go? Go ahead, Burgundy, and I'll go next. Um, I was going to say, I don't know about disruptive behavior disorders, but they do think that pretty much everything in children's mental health has increased since the pandemic. Um, and I'm pretty sure the behavior or the disruptive behavior disorders have as well. Um, but across the board, children's mental health is like uh, really, really going up in um, problems. As for what I tell parents, um, this may not be an exact like recommendation. I tend to tell the parents that like, what I do is I talk to a parent about the child's um, strengths and, and positives that they have going for them versus the negatives that I think will be something we have to pay attention to. So like if I see a kid who had prior to the pandemic done fine, they have good family support, maybe they didn't have many mental health problems, they don't have any physical problems, and then they weren't at school and so aren't, are social, like, aren't socializing as much and so now they're isolating and the parents want to know how that's going to go. I say just like probably based on this course, they're going to be fine, you know, so maybe we need to touch on depression a little bit or, or redo some of the boundaries, but if that child had enough uh, positive factors beforehand, then I don't think the pandemic will, it'll just be a blip, it won't be their whole personality. Whereas if there was already a lot of um, problems, dysregulation, chaos, a lot of behavioral issues, then that's just another thing that makes life hard. Um, so yeah, I don't want to take up too much time. What do you want to say, uh, Dr. Kobelman? Uh, I would say very similar. I feel like I saw a blip upward in the number of referrals, like six months to a year after like the initial wave of the pandemic. I never know when to say the pandemic's over. But, you know, when people seem to start coming back to clinic, it seemed like maybe people were holding off and then behaviors got slightly more intense. Um, and my suggestions would be pretty similar to what you were just describing. Great, thank you. We have a number of questions that have come in. How do you differentiate between ADHD and attention-seeking behaviors or other reasons a child may present with ADHD? Do you guys diagnose ADHD in psychology, technically? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, what I would say is I look at the, for me, everything in mental health and what makes it more interesting but also difficult is it all comes down to a pattern and context. So there can be kids who are kind of ADHD, but they aren't fully ADHD, and I don't call them ADHD. It's only when everything, so for ADHD, you have to have two contexts. So if it's at school and at home or at home and daycare, whatever, that's an indication to me that it's not just a behavior, it's there's some sort of pattern going on. Also, I look at how severe are all these behaviors compared to the norm, um, compared to other kids, but also compared to the developmental stage. So is this a child who really is like friendly and loves attention and wants to hug everyone? Okay, but can they sit and pay attention during class? Yeah, then maybe they just like to hug everyone. Or maybe they get really frustrated easily because they just are temperamentally irritable but they're still doing fine in class and they still sleep okay and there aren't other issues, then that's when I call it a behavior uh, versus it's a whole syndrome. But I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I was just gonna add, right? So um, thinking about what Todd was saying in terms of that Sherlock Holmes hat and thinking about you know what might be reinforcing this behavior over time, I kind of think about that separate from the symptoms of ADHD. Um, cause certainly ADHD kids can, um, have, um, some disruptive behaviors that they've done, um, to, um, uh, get access to things they like, to get out of things they don't like to do, as well as to gain the attention of others. And it really is pretty individualized that way. And I don't know as though kids with ADHD want, lean one way or the other in terms of the function of their disruptive behavior. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We have another question. Um, you talked about different therapies for different age groups. I have seen for younger children play therapy. Is this something seen um, seen to be effective in younger age groups as well? So what I'll say is in terms of the research literature, um, there isn't enough evidence to say that 
play therapy, you know, as a whole is a evidence-based approach for disruptive behaviors. That's not to say for, you know, an individual child that it's not the way to go. And I would think particularly if there were um, some uh, relational difficulties or anxiety or depression underlying um, or comorbid to the uh, to the disruptive behavior, um, it may make sense. Um, but as a whole, they aren't evidence considered evidence based. And I would, if I can, just kind of jump in that my preference with with children with these kinds of behaviors is an approach like PCIT that actively involves the parents, because in my experience, expecting a child to kind of go into a room with a therapist like me, and then what we call generalize or learn these new skills and then apply them if the parents aren't involved in learning the treatment actively, that's a pretty big expectation for a child. Um, so I just find it works better when the parent is kind of the active ingredient along with their child. Thank you. Can you talk about the correlation between ADHD and ODD further? Oh, is that, is that going to take more time big, than we have? <laughs> no, no. Okay. My short answer is that they're highly comorbid. Um, so really likely if a kid has ADHD, they're also going to have ODD and vice versa. Some people will say that untreated ADHD eventually can lead to more ODD because children are getting punished. So unfortunately, ADHD kids like mess up a lot and then they get punished for it. And so it's also, they've shown that ADHD can correlate with harsh parenting. And I'm not saying because kids have ADHD that they had a harsh parent, but the problem is the kids like who have ADHD, then they constantly are getting this negative feedback or this punishment. And so then they get irritable and angry and they get a little bit more oppositional because they're stuck. So I will say it can be, um, it's just highly comorbid, but I'm sure there are multiple reasons why. You know, also if you can't think, and, or you can't stop and think, and the first thing that comes out of your mouth just comes out, that would very easily lead to an oppositional situation. I always joke that like, if I were at a meeting with my boss and said everything that first came to my mind, they would diagnose me with ODD. But luckily the ADHD, you know, I can calm down what I'm trying to say and not say it. Um, hopefully that answers it. Okay, thank you. Any suggestions for separation anxiety for kids since COVID? Praise them when they're being brave. The end. <laughs> Kelly, did you have anything you want to oh, say? Oh, I was just going to say, I don't know as though like the, the pandemic really changes anything in terms of how to approach that with treatment. So, right. So that building up bravery um, and being able to try new things and working out ways that we can um, gradually avoid accommodating for that um, tend to be the best approaches. Okay, thank you. The next question, the answer is yes. <laughs> Did you guys see it? Oh, which one are you looking at? Do you oh, mean sorry, I just popped up and I said, if a three-year-old having multiple small temper tantrums per day for short periods, uh, would this be considered typical behavior? That's what I've been telling my husband when my three-year-old has been doing this multiple times a day. So I hope it's uh, normal. I, I would, without having a lot of information, I would say that's probably within the range of, of normal. Again, you have to look at things like the severity of the tantrums. You know, are they really attacking other, other kids or grownups? Are they doing things that are unsafe? How long are they lasting? It's such short. So I probably wouldn't be overly concerned. It would probably fall in that camp of monitor for me. Thank you. So it looks like we're getting close to time. And so and we answer, we address most of the questions. So I'll uh, cover a couple of housekeeping items before we close. Um, this course was certified for AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Attendees are eligible to claim continuing education uh, credit by completing the evaluation and attestation form and downloading your certificate of participation. The instructions to claim cl credit are included as a handout in the chat section. Um, I will also be sending this um, to all attendees in the follow-up email. So in closing, I just want to thank our presenters for this informative presentation, and I would like to thank you all for attending today, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.